So this morning, that narrative that Monica read to you is unfamiliar to many of us. It comes from a less well-known portion of the Hebrew Bible, a portion that tells the story of a return from exile and the reestablishing of what it means to be a people of God, particularly in the light of exile and conquest. On the surface, this is an incredible story and one that has many possible touch points for us as individuals and for us as a community of faith. There is also in this narrative a deeper story, and it is one of geopolitical maneuverings, which is so foreign to us. Because in our day and time, there are, of course, no examples of geopolitical maneuverings anywhere in the world, except maybe for North Korea, China, Russia, Syria, Iran, Iraq, just a few, just a few. In this narrative, Judah had been conquered by the Babylonians in 586 BCE. But then Babylon was conquered by the Persians in 539 BCE. The return of their people to their homeland came under the Persian rulers, and it began with King Cyrus. King Cyrus is an interesting character who, after 25 years of being rather silent, has received a lot of renewed attention lately due to some connections between current politics in the United States and events in the Middle East. Some conservative commentators love to point out that this is a wonderful example of God using non-godly people to accomplish God's will. Not sure who they're talking about. Or they reference Nehemiah returning to Jerusalem to build the walls as an example of what is happening on our southern borders. There's more than enough fodder for people to use in order to form a certain narrative in these passages, which are on the periphery, really, of our lectionary passage for today. But it is a cautionary tale, because various passages of Scripture can be cited and can have a deep impact on our modern thoughts. And when scripture is taken out of context, it can be used to justify almost anything. So what then is the context of this passage? And why should it matter to us in the middle of Eastertide during a series we have titled Recalled to Life? This narrative was written in a time of deep identity crisis for the Jewish people. It was a time where they were no longer, in reality, the Israelites because Israel had been conquered. Life had changed drastically. They were moving into a new era for the people. They were profoundly impacted by their defeat and exile. It was a loss beyond the destruction of the temple. It was a loss beyond their exile. It was a loss beyond losing their homes and everything they had. The loss was so devastating that it made them question who they were and wonder if indeed they had a future. Some of us have trouble identifying with these people because we came from absolutely no faith or religion. If we went to church as kids, it didn't stick. Many of us grew up with parents who didn't like formal religion and saw Sunday solely as the second day of the weekend rather than the day they went to church. But then something may have happened in our life that made us take stock of who we were and what was missing. We didn't feel like we were in exile because we had never left anything. There was instead an emptiness, a yearning, that we needed to explore. Many of us grew up as religious minimalists. We went to church on Christmas and Easter, and if we were Christian, we went to high holy days, festivals. We did all of these sorts of things, whether we were Christian or Jewish or Buddhist. But faith, faith was something that we knew only a small part about. 
And some of us weren't interested in learning more about something that seemed so far-fetched and out of reach. But there are some of us then who know this feeling quite well. We may have grown up in a place, a church that nurtured us and formed our understanding of faith. For much of our life, we felt grounded in that time and place. And we looked at the world through a particular lens. We saw a particular worldview, a particular view of who God was and who we were. But at some point, what we had known and believed no longer made sense to us. In fact, it felt as if our faith foundation had been destroyed, burned to the ground. We could no longer live in that place because for us, it was uninhabitable. So we went into exile, and we imagined we would never return to faith, to religion, certainly not to a church. We learned to live in exile. We became accustomed to our lives, and occasionally we wondered who we were and if our faith was completely gone. Even though we all come from different places, each one of us has at some point heard about a place that was rebuilding, a place that had once only been a shadow of itself, but it was a place that was now filled with spaciousness and beauty and the laughter of children, a place where the young and the old met, a place where love and grace were shared across gender, race, sexuality, national origin, and socioeconomic lines a place where ideas and intellectual rigor were combined with faith, a place that was open, accepting, and inclusive, a place where you were welcome to be who you are, to love who you love, and to explore your beliefs at your own pace, a place where all are truly welcome. Just like the people in our narrative in Scripture, when many of us came to this place, when we heard the words that were spoken, we cried because we had never heard these kinds of words that now filled our hearts and our minds. We cried because we had never known or we had forgotten who we could be. We cried because our exile or our emptiness had filled us with sadness. We cried because we hoped we could become part of the foundation of this church that feels like our new home. In our hearts, we all knew this place was not finished. At times, it did feel like we had reached a stasis, but it never lasted for long because as new people came each and every week, we knew there was still so much work to be done, and we knew that this work belonged to us. We knew this work was not the responsibility of only a few. We knew that this work was the responsibility of all of us together. When the Judean people began returning to their homeland and started to rebuild the temple, their lives were still fractured. And yet, they worked together to build their future. Earlier parts of this story speak of how the people upon returning gave not only their skills and talents to actually rebuild the temple, they also gave their possessions to finance the rebuilding. Building the temple this time was very different, and it required different skills. King Solomon, who was ruling at the time of the first temple, used forced labor for its construction. But when the people returned and began to rebuild, this time they did it on their own. It was rebuilt through their hard work and sacrifice through their coming together, even though they differed in their understandings and approaches. And in the absence of a monarchy, the second temple came to have a deeper meaning and a greater influence on the lives of the people than did Solomon's temple. In the narrative of Nehemiah, when the people heard the good news of the law being read, the scripture says they did not hear it with joy. Instead, they wept and mourned. It was painful to realize that the story they had been telling themselves about identity 
who they were, who they knew themselves to be, was no longer. And laying that aside, whether as an individual, a nation, or a community of faith, is hard work, and it's painful. But Ezra offered encouragement to the people to move beyond the pain and into action. Ezra encouraged their sacrifice and their offerings to God. He also encouraged that they should partake of the goodness that was offered. And he made it clear that this gift was not only for them, but was for everyone. Ezra compelled the people to understand that what they were experiencing was meant to be shared. Ten years ago, Dr. Kohlglazer came to this church, and he began rebuilding this church. And through these years, he worked with all of you to make this place what it is today. His leaving has the possibility of creating an identity crisis for us as individuals and for us as a community. Yet this passage from Nehemiah shows a different path, a way into the future that reminds us to care for ourselves, for each other, and to continue reaching out to those who are in need of a home just like this. Nehemiah reminded the people that the joy of the Lord is their strength. The joy of the Lord is also our strength. Even in times of unknowing, we are given an invitation to react or respond in new ways. We are being offered a new way of being as we recommit to who we can be together, to do the work God is calling us to do as a people who call this church and the City of Angels our home. One of the young men that I respect so much these days, his name is Julian DeShaver. He's from University Christian Church in Chicago. And he said in a sermon recently, resurrection is not about bringing back the old, but using it to do something new. What might it be like if today we embrace the truth that this church and all of us are being recalled to life. And that means we cannot go back to the old. It means we must embrace the newness. DeShaver, who is a minister and a musician, told his congregation that this newness is a rhythm God has given us, a melody created from the notes of all of our lives. He said we should not weep and disparage what God is creating, but we should rejoice and be part of this co-creating that is beginning even now. He said to do some of these things, there are things that must die, so we let them. Some things must end, and we let them end. And from the pieces the ashes, the rubble, we will take the wisdom and use it to do a new thing. In this Eastertide season, we claim that we have been recalled to life, and together we will begin living anew. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen.